I'm uh, Urban Sandrek from Intel. I'm part of our Infrastructure Competence Center. And I work a lot with cloud deployments and what we're going to be talking about here today, software-defined infrastructure. So I'm going to be co-presenting with Henrik from uh, Ericsson. So I'm going to start off at the very high level and take us a little bit deeper down into the details and then hand over to Henrik, who's going to cover really how software-defined infrastructure is realized in the practice. So first of all, uh, if we take a look around us and see what's happening uh, in the marketplace, there is a massive change going around. We see the change inside our comp companies, with our customers, with our partners, and we see business models are being turned upside down. There is a global equalization going on. The size of a company is no longer a guarantee of success. The innovative, they survive and they thrive. And the nervous and the slow, they go under. So, so we're in a period of an accelerated innovation. Some people refer to this as the third industrial revolution. And the prior two that uh, we have seen was based around coal and steam introduction, and in the early 1900s, around the electrification. So this one, the third one, is driven by compute and communications. And as you see on the picture, this is really the born of internet and the number of internet users we have seen in, in the world and the growth of it. And some said many years ago, now we've seen the internet being born. That's it, right? There is nothing more to it. But we continue to innovate. We continue to new, do new, new things. And we're all affected by it. As consumers, as small and large enterprises, and it's really a new era that we're seeing. It's uh, a new economic era that we're seeing what we can do with, uh, with the connected internet. So even though most of us here are very connected and we live the lives as we do with on, instant on, always on, constant demand for services, instant gratification, everything, there is still about 60% of the world's population that is not connected, that is not taking part of the world as we are experiencing it. 60% of the world's population. There's a massive amount of people that, uh, that we can address and that is relevant for this new economic era. So, So with this level of change and innovation that we're seeing, and the high degree of disruption that is going on, let's take a look at some of the drivers and enablers uh, companies are wrestling with. Business, and efficient, business efficiency and agility. It's all about saving money. So at Intel, we've been, we're meeting a lot of CXOs, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, and not just from an IT uh, executive perspective, but really from, from the corporate perspective. And a lot of the feedback we're hearing and have been hearing for the past, let's say, 12, 18 months, is the concern and the need for increased business agility. Companies need to be much quicker in deploying services, uh, capturing business opportunities. So really, business agility is one of the key drivers Another thing that Ed was talking about previously is obviously the security, the trust, and the privacy. That's a top of mind concern for, uh, for many companies and something we need to bear in mind. And obviously, there are a lot of new economic business models we're seeing that are being enabled by the connected world. For example, shared, econom shared economy. We've seen new companies like Airbnb and Uber coming from nowhere and really establish themselves as an enormous trademark. 
Airbnb, for example, gone from in a few years from nothing to being present in 40,000 cities around the world with more than 800,000 uh, rooms available. So, and obviously another uh, key driver would be uh, the macroeconomic effects. However, those we have slightly less control over. But being from Intel, obviously, I'm very proud to see how we can have an effect on the macroeconomics. You all heard about Moore's Law. We've lived Moore's Law for quite some time. And to simplify, more or less every second year, we're double compute performance. Now imagine if we couldn't realize Moore's Law, we would not be able to double compute performance every second year. But instead, it would be every third year. Where would we be today? Well, actually, rewinding back, today we would be at 1998 levels when it comes to internet and the capabilities we have. Smartphones, they would be nine years away. And social media, well, in best case, we would be ICQing. If anybody remember ICQ, that was probably around 90, <laughs> 1998. So, technology has a global impact on the macroeconomy economy as well. So, how are businesses responding? Well, the digital era is being embraced, and we were alluding to our uh, Airbnb and Uber and a lot of others. We are seeing a clear move to what we can call a digital convergence. Sometimes it works, sometimes it not. So really, di digital, digital com convergence is that we see traditional companies need to go and look at the digital economy to really capture these new opportunities. So we see a blending of the traditional way of making business and the new dig digital co economy. We see it everywhere, in automotive, in retail, in energy, in finance, insurances, you name it, in all businesses, more or less. When businesses are looking at uh, digital convergence, so where, where should you start in order to be successful? Well, you need to have a digital business platform. And here's a proposal. You can base it on SMAC. So SMAC is basically the confluence of four key technology shifts, being social, mobile, analytic, and cloud. So this isn't really just my perspective. It's more or less a consensus across the industry that this is the new enterprise IT model. In reports from IDC, we've seen them refer to this as the third platform, where mainframe computing was the first and the PC era was the second, and now we have the SMAC era, where everything is social, mobile, based on analytics, and going cloud. And Gartner as well. Gartner names it uh, the nexus of forces. So this is something we really couldn't do five years ago, but something we can do today. Leverage it, all these capabilities to ensure we capture new opportunities in the digital economy. And I already had this slide up somewhere, if it comes up, to give you some example of companies that really are embracing the SMAC concept or the SMAC as a digital business platform. I mentioned Airbnb previously, uh, Uber. Obviously, we have the well-known OTTs like Facebook and Twitter and what have you. And Netflix. Yeah, Netflix is, is an interesting one, especially from an anal analytics perspective. Some of you have probably seen the House of Cards or the Orange is the New Black series. Those were series produced based on analytic input, where Netflix really looked at the user base to find out what would be a successful show? What would attract people? So they use big data theories behind that and a lot of, of user-based data to establish those shows. So in the digital convergence context, context that, we've been in, that I've been describing, 
we're blending the traditional and digital business. So what is a digital business? To some extent, we can claim that this is the reinvention of enterprises. So let's take a look at some of the attributes uh, required to be a digital business. So I'm going to touch on uh, three characteristics for being a dig digital business. Those are data-driven, smart, on-demand, trusted, connected, and innovative. You can go to next. So if you look at the data-driven characteristics, for example, it's about, and I alluded to it previously with Netflix, it's about capturing the data. And everybody has heard probably the phrase, you need to be doing the big data. You need to transform your business with trusted and real-time data. Looking at the smart world, well, that's basically IoT. Everything is becoming connected. How can you capture that from a business opportunity perspective? You see opportunities in operational excellence that you can improve operational aspects. Let's take World Trade Center here in, in New York, for example. It consists of more than 600,000 connected sensors that you actually can capture and intelligently monitor the building and what's going on inside. And you have traffic flows and other type of systems that is also an evidence of how the world is becoming smart. Trust spoke about trust and security. Trust is it's really a, the heart of your brand identity. You can't afford to not have trust in your product and your solutions. We've seen it with Target. We've seen it with, uh, with others. So security needs to be a top business imperative. And we have the connected experience. And we have Ericsson here that live and breed the vision of a connected world. And to have a digital, really successful digital business, it also needs to be connected. And the last thing is innovation, an innovative workforce. Now, I spoke with uh, someone previously today about the challenge of, of attracting people when hiring people. It's a real co big concern. I saw a Stanford example that if you look at the global Fortune 500 companies, 2004, and compare them to last year, 2014, more than 40% of them are no longer on that Fortune 500 list. And then when you took it, take a look at the workforce that they attract, the Generation Y, only 7% of Generation Y is actually work, working for the Fortune 500 companies. And going forward, given the age, aging of our population. By 2025, the generation Y will make up 75% of the workforce. So what will happen with these global Fortune 500 companies if they can't attract the innovative workforce? So that's a really important characteristics as well, uh, character, characteristics uh, as well for capturing and establishing a good di digital business. Next. So the sixth one that I had as a characteristic uh, is the on-demand. And that's really about going to the, to the cloud. And that's what we're going to be focusing on here now. And going to the cloud is about increasing agility while reducing operational costs. So we see moving everything uh, into a service infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. We have security as a service. We see the agility and responsiveness being critical aspects where we need to be able to deploy a service in minutes or hours, not days and weeks. And at Intel, our own IT, um, I think it's public, by the way. They produce a lot of the public reports that you can go and download. Uh, they've been looking at deploying software-defined infrastructure, a more intelligent way of orchestrating and deploying new services. And in this process, they discovered that in their legacy system, it took them over 100 days to deploy a new service, to get it provisioned, to get it approved, to get it deployed. Today, in the new system they have deployed, 
it takes less than a couple of hours. It's a massive improvement. And that's what we're going after with the software-defined infrastructure. But we also need a cloud in order to be open for innovation. So if we have a, a cloud that is based on open standards, where we can leverage a public cloud deployment model, moving towards a private cloud and have a transparent deployment model, it is really becoming very good innovation platforms. But it comes, comes down to the APIs that you use and how you deploy them. Okay, next please. One more please. So, and you can, it's a build, so you can click one more. Thank you. So looking at the various types of clouds, we obviously been talking and uh, been addressing the public clouds, such as uh, Amazon. We also have the private clouds, but we are, we're seeing new types of clouds being formed. Collaboration clouds, partner clouds. And the essence of this moving forward is that we need to be able to have hybrid cloud solutions. So let's say you want to be very agile and, and, and deploy a new service. It's a perfect way of using a public cloud. Develop, an, develop your service for the public cloud, deploy it there. But as the business takes off and you see that the, your model is sustainable, you may want to consider to move it to a private cloud. It could be for IPR reasons. It could be for pure cost reasons. You see a, a value in operating your own infrastructure. But as, as you have moved that to your private cloud, you may have peak needs. Let's say you're, you have peak, uh, peak usage, usage models in, 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 uh, in your private cloud. Well, if you have a standardized API and means by of moving workloads from your private cloud into the public cloud to address those peak concerns, it's a great way of expanding and dynamically managing your, your business. So, there's a Gartner report that came out a while back saying that 50% of all em enterprises are expecting to have hybrid cloud deployments by 2070. So that's fairly soon, and that's very encouraging to see. And from the Intel perspective, we are driving, and we're, our ambition is really to enable private, public, and, and hybrid cloud usage models. So in, if you go next. So as part of that strategy, we're driving what, what I've been mentioning a few times here, the software-defined infrastructure. So what is the software-defined infrastructure, or the SDI? It's really a vision for an infrastructure that is entirely controlled by software. It's highly optimized, it's fault tolerant, it's agile, and it's adaptive. If you consider the data centers, or most data centers of today, and the resources, compute, storage, networking, they often sit in stovepipes. Hardware is defined fixed function appliances, or a server is fixed function appliance. And management, if you look at the management aspect in the data center, it's very often a manual and fairly slow process. You may have equipment from multiple vendors with different management APIs that you need to interface and that you need to control. And all of this is slowing down your ability to deploy services quickly. So what does tomorrow look like? We, we need to envision an architectural transformation that, that there is a resource shift that everything that has been hardware defined needs to be software defined. We need to think of this from an application perspective. We have seen that partly in, uh, partly in uh, the virtualization era that we have had for quite some time, 10 years or so. We have had massive uh, virtualization deployments. And it's, a, it's about kind of software defining compute if we simplify it. But now we need to do this for other resources as well, like storage, like networking. So if we look at from the application layer and down, the three pillars, or we could say four pillars, but it's not visible here, 
in the software-defined infrastructure is obviously the application and that you attach a service level agreement or service level objective with your application. It's the orchestration layer that is capable of understanding that service level agreement. And there's a resource pool with the hardware available. And the fourth one, not visible here, is really the telemetry of that as well, to really be able to see what's going on in that resource pool and have a feedback loop into the orchestrator to make more intelligent decisions. So, if we go next. Before we continue on the uh, software-defined infrastructure, I want to ask you a few questions, more or less. Are you ready to move into the cloud? Can you move into the cloud? A few questions to consider. Is your application hard-coded by any means in terms of file names, directories, or host names or ports? Is your application secure? Can you allow to have an application that resides in the public cloud? Do you have any data restrictions? Is it hard-coded from a data locality perspective? or is it very portable? Can your application scale up and down based on load? There are a number of architectural principles you, sh you, you should consider when developing for the cloud. I can mention a few. Resilient to fall, failure, resilient to latency, obviously security, location independent. You should have an application that is elastically scalable, you should consider a service-oriented architecture uh, or composability, if you if you'd like. You should design for manageability and really think about being bandwidth-aware and also be cost and resource consumption-aware. Those are a few of the, the principles uh, to consider. Next, please. So we can consider an application maturity stack, more or less, going from bottom up. Uh, if you're really, truly cloud enabled with your application. We start from the bottom. You have virtualized, and that's what we've seen for quite some time. Your, in, your infrastructure uh, is capable of um, running virtualized um, images. It can be initiated from a script, for example. It can be a multi-tiered application with a set of VM image images, but it's really not taking advantage of the dynamic nature of cloud and SDI. So moving upwards, we have the loosely coupled application in the maturity model, where you see that we can decouple the application into services, and those services are becoming discoverable by names. So this is important from the scalability aspects, if you look in the data center or across the cloud, because now you can start deploying your application in different parts of the data center or in different parts of the cloud, because the application itself can query the various services by name, and it's not hard-coded. So the orchestrator can also move around these services as needed in order to increase utilization. And moving upwards, uh, next level would be abstra abstracted, ensuring that your application is stateless. So you're not dependent on the service being alive all the time. You can actually cope with uh, a scenario where the service is going down. And lastly, you want to make sure your application is adaptive, that you actually dynamically can migrate across various infrastructures without interruption or disruption to your service. For example, provis uh, dynamically provision uh, more capacity uh, as the load increases on your application. There are a number of cloud-aware design patterns to consider, such as the circuit breaker, re request queuing, request collapsing, Object, sh object change notification, service discovery, and 
stateless services, authorization patterns, and the likes. So now let's move back to the software-defined infrastructure uh, stack. If you click next, and it's a build, so you can click next. So you remember I said there were a couple of key aspects. We have the application that where we want to have a software level, uh, uh, ser sorry, service-level agreement attached or a service-level objective attached to the application. We have the orchestrator that should be able to place that workload, your application, somewhere in the cloud or in the data center. And underneath we have uh, the resource pooling. And really, looking at the resource pooling, that's, that's where we see an opportunity to improve things uh, quite dramatically. So we spoke about traditional, uh, the, the traditional stovepipes and uh, the hard-coded servers. What we're looking at and what we're doing with something we call the Intel rack scale architecture is taking an ambition of disaggregating that traditional server, basically shopping it up. Instead of being a box that you ship with compute, with memory, with networking, and with direct uh, attach attached storage, you can consider managing the compute by itself, or the storage by itself, or the network by itself. But in order to do that, you need to have a management layer in your infrastructure, in your data center, that is actually capable of understanding what do I have in my resource pool and how can I assemble things in my resource pool to create a logical resource. So taking it from the top, the application has a set of service level uh, objectives, goes to the orchestrator and says, I need to meet these objectives. Can you please give me the hardware resources I need? The orchestrator goes down to the management layer of the data center saying, these are the resources I need. And the management player looks at the available resources and exposes a logical server, if you want to, by composing resources from various bits and pieces in the data center as it fits. And the ambition here, the, the real big ambition, is to drive up utilization. And the role model has been the big OTT companies, the Facebook, the Twitters, the Googles where you can see in their data centers, they have been doing, we can say, disaggregation for, for quite some time. But they have a, a quite nice opportunity for doing so because they have a limited set of workloads, they know their environment, and they can optimize based on that environment. So you can see utilization levels up to probably around 80% in a data center like Facebook's. Whereas in a traditional enterprise data centers, I wouldn't be surprised if your IT department would say, oh, yeah, our, our utilization level is around 20%. Or if they are heavily adopting virtualization, maybe their utilization level is 40% or 50 at the best. But with a solution, introducing software-defined infrastructure and things like Intel rack scale architecture, disaggregating the hardware, we are striving to drive that utilization level up, even in the enterprise data centers allowing a much higher utilization level. So, if you click next, another thing to consider uh, when building a modern data center that's gonna take advantage of its software-defined infrastructure and leveraging disaggregation is obviously opt uh, optic optics. Reason being, if you wanna disaggregate hardware, you need a very fast interconnect between your various components. You need to have low latency. So optics become key, but also if you have, look at the bigger data, bigger data center with multiple racks or multiple pods, you have a distance consideration to take. If you want to increase uh, the utilization in the data center and your orchestrator says, I have a workload requiring X amount of compute, maybe that compute isn't available within the same rack. Maybe you have to look at the rack next door and in order to present a logical server or a logic, logical resource that the application thinks is one and the same server, you really need to have this fast interconnect with low latency between the racks to enable that in a good way. So optics is going to be a key thing uh, moving forward. So we're at the early days with introducing this. 
the whole concept, obviously, around software-defined infrastructure has been around. But the Intel Rack scale architecture was something we announced in August. It's available. It consists of a number of various best-known methods that we have taken from our experience in working with Facebook and Microsoft and many others on how to build efficient data center hardware. It also consists of a reference software stack for doing this composability of disaggregated resources. It's available as open source, downloadable from Intel's open source site, 01.org. And all the specification and documents are available on the Intel website. Now, we are very pleased to work together with Ericsson as one of the partners implementing and leveraging the rack scale architecture. And we're going to be hearing some more details from Henrik and later on from the Ericsson team that's going to allow you to do some hands-on experience how you can do or how you can deploy a service in this new digi digital economy leveraging software-defined infrastructure and rack scale architecture. So with that, I'm happy to hand it over to you, Henrik. Okay, the clicker, we have to take care of that. Uh, okay, I can introduce myself while we're waiting for the clicker. Uh, I'm Henrik Beckström. Uh, I work with marketing in Ericsson in a B business unit called Cloud and IP. So I've worked quite a lot with Urban uh, related to rack scale architecture, software defined infrastructure, but also other software products. Uh, this is actually the first time I interact with software developers. Uh, it's a very good experience so far, so let's hope for a good continuation. Uh, okay, so I will, um, I will talk about our implementation of software-defined infrastructure. Uh, but before I go in and talk about this product, it's actually a product we're doing together with Intel, uh, I would like to say a few words about the context and what we're trying to achieve with software-defined infrastructure. Urban touched upon it uh, a bit earlier, but it is really about uh, improving the economics of the data center by dramatically increase the utilization in the data centers, uh, improve automation capabilities uh, to bring various enterprises, including our traditional operator customers that Ericsson work with, uh, up to similar levels as the best-in-class cloud providers like Facebook, Amazon, and Google. And of course, that should be doable for all kinds of applications and workloads. Uh, and it's really, uh, it really comes down to two different things in this work to become very good in running these data centers. And the first one is about asset efficiency having a very high utilization in your data centers and your resources, and then also have, have a very good operational efficiency, meaning that uh, you can run a very big data center, a lot of traffic uh, with a limited number of people. So there you can see that the best-in-class cloud providers, they are doing this very well. Uh, they build their own infrastructure and they implement processes that are sort of tailored for their needs, while uh, many others are using, uh, are buying in equipment, buy in their own software, etc., and are not as successful. So that is what we want to achieve to bring uh, more companies up to the top right corner. So today we have this discussion about. Uh, you might be able to buy very flexible solutions and run flexible solutions, but that has a cost in terms of low utilization. And vice versa, you can have dedicated or uh, application-specific solutions with very high utilizations, but then you will not be so flexible. Uh, and software-defined infrastructure and our implementation of it will hopefully lead them that you can increase the utilization but still be flexible in terms of how you can refresh your system, how you can modernize it and expand it. Uh, so in order to address this uh, area or challenge, uh, Ericsson teamed up with Intel uh, a bit more than a year ago uh, around this rack scale architecture to implement it in one of our products. 
Uh, and you can see this, uh, this slide shows uh, from the launch early this spring where the two CEOs of our companies uh, launched this uh, product together, HDS 8000, in order to address uh, what we call the hyperscale cloud market uh, to make data centers and the cloud infrastructure much more efficient and automated and cost, uh, cost efficient. Uh, before I give some details about this product, HTS 8000, and that is a data center hardware product or a hyperscale data center system, as we call it. Uh, of course, you need other things as well uh, to run a hyperscale cloud very well. You need infrastructure as a service uh, product. You need platform as a service products, for example, for hybrid cloud, which Urban mentioned, uh, container management and then various appliances, which we called converged clouds, for example, related to various storage solutions. So this is what we call the Ericsson Cloud System. It is one cloud platform for handling all workloads. It could be telecom workloads, which we are very used to. It could be private IT workloads or commercial cloud workloads. So this is a full stack solution we say it's open and the different parts are independent of each other and every layer exposed. It's industrialized and hybrid cloud, meaning it's automated, it's governed, and it fulfills all the regulations needed where you want to deploy this kind of equipment. Uh, so a few words then on this product. Uh, as I said, HDS, it stands for Hyperscale Data Center System, and it's a converged solution, meaning that includes storage, networking, and uh, compute in one system. It is disaggregated, meaning that the various life cycles for the components, for example, switch or for networking, for memory, for storage, uh, they are independent of each other. So you can refresh uh, various parts without having to touch other parts, since to be on the optimal technology life cycle, you want to do that differently for different parts of the system. Uh, it has an optical interconnect, and why is that important? Up to now, we see mainly electrical interfaces or electrical interconnect, but that means you are limited to the rack, basically, in terms of pooling the resources. By using the opti optical interconnect, you remove that barrier and you can work with resource pools across a number of racks or across an entire data center. And that will also make it easier for you to bring up utilization. And then you need the software part, which is actually one, the one where we implement the software defined infrastructure. Here you do the automation, you compose the servers or the nodes that you need for your specific applications. You have the analytics and similar type of functionality here. And I will show you a brief demo about this uh, command center in a few minutes. Uh, so we say that we have one pool handling all workloads. And as you can see here on the slide, we break up the various uh, resources from each other. So we create one pool for CPU, one pool for memory, one pool for storage, etc. And then we build them up again using this optical interconnect and use our software, the command center, to create machines for various types of applications in the data center. It could be telecom applications, it could be IT media type of application in a private cloud environment or commercial cloud environment. So it's really about optimizing on the software level uh, and order the hardware you need to fulfill your specific requirements. So here is a comparison uh, when you have today's rack servers compared with disaggregated servers that we are working to achieve. Uh, as you can see, in today's fixed configurations, you have a lower rate of utilization for all the resources, basically, in the system. But if you move to a disaggregated architecture, you will be more flexible. You can build out the system one, in a 
a more flexible way, and you will increase utilization quite dramatically. So if you look at the bottom diagram to the left, you can see the gray parts there. They are basically waste, wasted resources today, or overdimensioning because you don't have an optimized system. And we will mitigate or reduce that uh, challenge or problem going forward. Uh, bare metal cloud or bare metal as a service is, uh, is a cloud proposition that is becoming very hot. Uh, this is really about providing the ability for enterprises to order the hardware they need, specific hardware, without having it virtualized. So you can get that delivered as a service, for example, using the product HDS 8000, uh, and be very specific on exactly the type of hardware you want. And then you do whatever you like with that. You, put, you can put VMware on it, you can put OpenStack on it, or other types of applications. So bare metal as the cloud is coming uh, as a strong public cloud proposition going forward. Uh, so now I'm going to show you a brief demo, or it's actually a screencast of a demo. It's not the real demo, but this is the command center uh, I have been talking about, which is the software or the hardware management part of the product. Uh, so if you click there, uh, what you can see here now is the, it's a graphical user interface. So it's a demo interface. But for most of you, you will probably be working with APIs into the system to obtain the functionality you need. So this is the start page of the command center where you get an overview of all the resources in the data center in the morning. Uh, it's the view of a data center operator or an owner of a data center. So you can get a quick check on what is working well, what is not working well. Uh, if you wouldn't be an enterprise customer of this data center, you would of course also see your resources, but you would be limited to those resources. You couldn't see uh, your neighboring enterprise resources, for example. Uh, we can take a look at another function here in the command center, and that is the inventory. Uh, so here you can see all the machines, basically, we have in the data center. And you can also see that it is not only Ericsson's equipment, but also equipment from third-party vendors, because we believe it's important for such a system to be multi-vendor compliant. If you want to examine a specific machine, you can uh, search, uh, for example, on HTS in the search field, uh, and drill down for one specific machine to get uh, more information. So you'll see here that you can find uh, performance information for the resources. Uh, you could get metrics, uh, the historical data on performance, for example, power consumption, CPU utilization, similar type of information. Uh, you could get uh, information about the operating system, peripherals, storage, and similar. All kind of information you need to optimize your systems. You can find the location of a machine in the data center, which becomes very important if you need to do some physical maintenance in the data center. And of course, set, set thresholds as well. So the idea here is that if we want to become very good at managing data centers, of course, we have to start with the individual machines and be very good at managing them. So this is really the purpose with the command center. Uh, then we have the discovery function. Uh, and here you get a list of all the machines that you have in the data centers, but they are not managed by the command center. So they are, they are in the data center for some reason, but they're not being managed. Here you can bring them in to becoming managed and part of the command center and do the performance checks and similar. Then we have an analytics, analytics function as well. Uh, so this is really about uh, gathering historical data, uh, collecting it, and use it for clever decisions, what you want to do with the system or how you can improve performance. In this case, we show uh, power utilization or power consumption of the data centers. And based on the data we have in the system, uh, we can make a trends 
Uh, we also know what the maximum level is, and by that we can set a warning level, we can set critical levels, uh, and if we go into these thresholds, we can take actions based on the information we have here. So for example, the warning level here states that we have reached 85% of the allowed power consumption. We also get a recommended solution to that, what we can do to mitigate that problem. So this is really about optimizing your data center and get automation into it to become more efficient. Uh, then we're going into the final part of this little demo, and that's the node composition part. I was talking about that you could create your own infrastructure or order your own uh, servers or different types of resources, and that we do here in the node composition. So basically, uh, you want to build a machine for a certain application or workload. Here you can go in and select which type of hardware you need, for example, CPU, which network interfaces you need, if you need software, if you want software with it. You can define that here too. Uh, and the idea is then that uh, you will use the command center to power it up and put it into service. So when you have made your choices here, uh, you can make a search in the data center to see are there any machines that match my requirements. So we'll get that now, and uh, you get a list of machines that you could use in your data center to handle this application, for example. So you choose one there, uh, and you get, a, you get to do a review if this is really the thing you need. Uh, and if you accept that, there will be a, uh, a process to take it into service. So it's called allocation process, and uh, there will be configuration done, there will be health checks done, and also put it into service then, and you can start running your application on it. So now this node will be part of the inventory as well, so once it's been taken into traffic, you can use that function to go in uh, and retrieve the various types of information you need. So that's the idea with this command center, and this is really how we implement the software defined infrastructure we use this interface or the API to create our infrastructure for our workloads. Uh, so we launched this product uh, back in February, March. Uh, we have a first customer for this HTS 8000. It's a South Korean operator called SKT. Uh, they will use this product to modernize their data centers, uh, to increase the level of automation uh, and similar. So hopefully we will be able to announce more of these customers going forward. So to summarize, uh, we implement this software-defined infrastructure together with Intel using Raxel architecture in our product HDS 8000. Uh, it enables hardware disaggregation, which we believe will have a very positive impact on utilization together with an optical interconnect and using a command center function, either graphical interface or API. Uh, you build your own hardware, basically. You do analytics, inventory management, and similar. Thank you for that. All right. Visit appalliance.org to access resources and join a global network of developers.